This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. Give a hand for Pastor Dave as he comes. Amen. You love Jesus? I'm going to move this to the middle like a normal preacher. Weirdos. Turn your Bibles. Go to Psalms 25. Psalms 25. I'm preaching out of a beautiful black cowhide leather ESV Bible tonight that Pastor Mark blessed me. If you don't, if you've never felt cowhide, just come up here after the service. You can lay your hands and feel how amazing uh, this Bible feels at the end of the service. Um, do you love your pastors? Come on, that was like a golf cheer or something. Do you love your pastors? Well, you should. You know, the Bible says that those who are over you in the Lord, you should esteem them highly. You should respect them uh, because they watch over your souls. And it should be a joy for them because they have to give an account for how they lead you. And if it's not a joy for them, if they have to groan in their shepherding of your life, uh, it's, no advantage, it's of no advantage to you. And uh, Megan and I were so fortunate six years ago to meet them. And when we were serving on staff together with them, we just knew that one day we would work with them. And about nine months later, we came here to Atlanta with them to take the church from Pastor Gene and Miss June and help and assist them uh, in the work that God had called them here. And, and it just blesses me to, to visit and see so many faces and so many people I don't know and, and uh, so many things happening. Um, because when we first moved up here, it was just, it was just three of us. And uh, the other day I laughed because I, I use Evernote. Well, I did use Evernote back then. Anybody remember that app, that organization app, Evernote? I pulled it up on my uh, computer, and I had the notes from our very first staff meeting on June 25th, 2012, where we all sat together and began to dream about what's in this room right now. Let me, let me tell you something about that right there. Let me tell you something about the gospel. Do you believe God is perfect? Okay. Do you believe that you're imperfect? That's the gospel. Because Jesus is that thing between us that we need. And isn't it a foolish thing that once Jesus ascended back to the Father, he said, I'll use imperfect people to lead the church that I started. You know, the thing I love about learning who your leaders are is that in your imperfection, they lead an example in front of you. Paul said to Corinth, who was a crazy church like us, filled with crazy people like you and me. And at one point, Paul's having such a hard time explaining to them what living for Christ is. He just says, watch me. He says, imitate me as I am in Christ. That's what he says. He says, we're all imperfect. Everything is lawful, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful, but not everything is permissible. Everything is lawful, but not everything is helpful. And I've spent this whole letter trying to explain to you what the life of Christ looks like. Just, just watch me. Just follow my example of faith. That was his encouragement to us. And that is what's so amazing about knowing who your pastors are. See, a lot of people are shopping for churches you should be looking for leaders. Because a leader will drive from Savannah to Atlanta with you with a dream in them and nothing to show for it. And then five years later, you get to sit and celebrate in the middle of the manifestation of the dream you had all those years ago. Because you realize we're all imperfect serving the one perfect, the one perfect person who is Christ Jesus. And if you can find somebody who is willing to share with you their successes and their failures, then you're able to follow someone's example of faith. And what you find is that they watch over your soul because they are following after Christ. So you join the body 
instead of going to church. And you find leaders instead of shopping for churches. Quit trying to find someone to give you a TED Talk with some scripture. Find someone who will bring a word that changes your life. And then when you struggle to apply it, you can call them, go to Mexican and sit over salsa and work it out. That's what a leader is. See, our church is growing in Savannah because I'm young and it's filling up with young people and young families and people who are coming back to church for the first time in a long time or coming to church for the first time ever. And every time I go into something that I know is difficult to hear that is so different from what they have lived or the pattern that they've adopted in their life, I just say to them, listen, if this is hard for you, take me to Mexican this week. We'll get some salsa. We'll figure it out together. Where did I learn that from? And can I tell you how amazing that has been? Can I tell you how wonderful that has been to have watched a shepherd for five years and then just to follow his example of faith and experience true community with the people who trust me to be their pastor? I heard another man who's been in the game a long time last week who spoke at my church. He said some really wise words. He said, the Lord loves you enough to tell you who your pastor is. You need to find that and learn to honor and learn to give grace and extend grace and forgive as you have been forgiven and follow their example of imperfection and success. And you'll be blessed. Now, Gene and June Evans, they're about as close to perfect as you can get. For those of you who've been around since they started this whole thing, y'all are in a whole other category. So bless y'all that y'all are still here. We're all the misfits that came and changed everything and painted walls. Anyway, never mind. I'm always about to say something kind of mean right there. <laughs> Taking it back. Let me read something to you. It's out of Psalms 25, starting in verse 4. It says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. I want to tell you something about the cross. Jesus came and died your death so that you could live his life. He died your death so that you could live his life. Let me put it to you in another way, maybe you've never thought of before. You're living the life he would have lived had he not gone to the cross. You're supposed to be, take it a step further, living the life he would have lived had he not gone to the cross. What gives him the right to command things of us and how we should live our life? Because it was his to live and he gave it away. Listen to what I just said. What gives him the right to command things of me and how I live my life? Because it was his to live and he gave it away. He died my death, so I'm living his life. My team and I, we're getting ready for the fall, and I'm going to be teaching through the whole book of Corinthians, which has been challenging. Yesterday, Pastor Mark and I spent hours at Gumbo's. It was so painful, uh, painfully delicious. Uh, <laughs> talking about just the first few verses of that book because Paul was dealing with exactly what we're dealing with today. He was shepherding a group of people that everything he was saying was so foreign to them. I mean, if you can summarize the whole book, I would say this is Paul describing what it is to live his life. What does it mean to live his life, to live the life of Christ? And so we sat there yesterday just working through different verses and different scriptures and how do you communicate this to a 21st century audience of people, the things that Paul talks about? Because he doesn't, he doesn't hold anything back. And what I hear in this verse here, when I hear David saying, Make your ways known to me, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I will wait all day long. This is what comes to mind. And this is what I think, the re, this is the reason I believe that Corinthians was so long, and then he had to write a sequel. Right? Because the will of God is messy. Okay? You're a part of the story. He's writing a story. You're doing a series next week called The Book of Life. And for some reason, in our minds, we think the book of life is a roster. 
The book of life is a story. You've been written in it from the foundation of the world. Those who don't believe in him's names are blotted out. There's not someone standing waiting to write your name in. Your name is already there. You're a part of a story. He's writing the story through history, his story. And he's putting you in it. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And it's messy. There's a message in, about you. There's a message about your life. The word message, what is it? It's a mess that is aged. A message is a mess that is aged. The thing that I have found, the thing that Megan and I keep seeing over and over and over, the reason why we are able to keep connecting with so many people, the reason why we see our church having problems, big good problems, is because I keep getting up talking about all our junk. I keep standing in front of the people and talking about the ways I've failed and the ways I've succeeded talking about our daily hang-ups and heartaches and hardships. Because this is the thing I want our people to know. This is the thing I want you to know tonight. Knowing the will of God for your life is not about knowing some big picture, not about knowing some ultimate one-sentence thing. It's about inviting Jesus into the daily decisions that you make, inviting him into the circumstances and the situations that are going on in your life where you say to him, what I do in this moment matters to you, therefore it matters to me. How I handle myself, the way I walk and talk and carry myself, how I treat my wife and raise my children, it either brings glory to you or it doesn't. I know you're pleased with me because you're pleased with your son, but I want my actions to be those of obedience so that my life pleases you. I don't want just my position in heaven to be righteousness. I want my condition on earth to be righteousness. I want to walk in the ways of righteousness. Convict me, O oh Lord, by your Holy Spirit that I may be changed into the image of Christ Jesus, that my life would be that that Jesus would have lived if he was still here. That's what I want. The righteousness of Christ Jesus to be evident in my life because his Holy Spirit lives within me. And it's guiding the daily decisions that I make. People say things like, I don't know the will of God for my life. It's right here. I can't hear God's voice. It's right here. It's right here. His word is his will. His will is his word. Listen to what he's saying. Teach me, O oh Lord, to what? To know your ways. He didn't even say, tell me the purpose for my life. He said, teach me your ways. Teach me your ways so that I can follow your steps. You are my salvation. I want to be like you. I want my decisions to please you. See, this is another level of discipleship, of realizing what he said when he said, my disciples will pick up their cross and follow me. What he's saying is, he tells you to put your identity down, your history and who you are, lay it down and pick his up. Which is why Paul says, it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So every decision of my life, I'm asking the question. That was my beautiful blue-eyed son back there. <laughs> every decision I make, I'm asking the question, does this please God? Does this honor him? Am I obeying his word? Do I know his word? How do I know his ways? I have to know his word. How do I know his will? By following his ways. The Bible says... That as I grow in faith, I'm able to please God. You can't please him without faith. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? Come on, somebody. Teach me your ways. Because here's what will happen. When you know the Father, life is better. I know you believe in Jesus. I know you believe in the Son. 
but the Son came so that you could know the Father. I don't want that to confuse you because they are one. But every good gift comes from above. And I'm able to walk into his throne completely imperfect because of the perfection of his son. I walk in under the cover of his blood and I'm able to bring everything in my heart to the throne without disturbing his holiness or righteousness because I'm holy because Christ made me holy. He gave me his righteousness. He gave me his past, his admittance, his ticket into the throne of God. I walk in his ways to the throne of my father and I can have communion with the creator of the cosmos. Our Father who is in heaven. When I know him, suddenly I get confident about life. That's faith. When I know him, I'm confident in his character. That's faith. When I know him, I'm confident in his word. That's faith. Over and over and over. Someone asked me the other day, they said, so what's it like being a pastor? You know, this is a question I get a lot. And here's what I'll say back to loving your leaders it is all the things you imagine it is excuse me it's preaching it's praying it's visiting people it's counseling people it's it's all those things but the one thing that I didn't appreciate when I worked for him and served under him and saw obviously because it wasn't in my view or my focus is the sheer volume of decisions that you have to make every day And how they are connected to so many lives at once. And how there are emotions connected to those decisions at every moment. Where you just have to have the Holy Spirit's help in every little thing you do. Because so many are watching you and you are leading so many as an example of faith. Right? And there are so many things that when I was the right hand looking up, I would say, when I'm in charge... Right? In my heart, you all do it too. Some of you have been doing it today, even in this service. So, bless you. You're forgiven, right? So, I would have these thoughts in my heart where I would say, you know, when I'm in charge, this is what I'm going to do. And then I became a pastor. And I call him every day, what do I do? (laughs) It's true. It's true. And, you know, the same is true in becoming a dad. And there, there are a lot of things Megs and I do that we plan to do. But when I became a dad, I mean, obviously, there were a ton of things I thought I would do that I don't just because he wasn't there when I had those premeditated ideas. And now he's here. A lot has changed. And as I was praying for you, praying about tonight, there were two very funny things that happened in the last year with Seth that came to my mind that I want to share with you about the Father. I feel like the Father brought these back to my memory to share with you because I want you to know his ways. I want you to have confidence in his character. So there's a group of you here tonight that have something in your life that is just eating you up with worry. And a part of it is the mystery of it. You don't know what it is yet. Or maybe there's this thing you're waiting for and you don't know when it's coming. You're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. I want to give you a good little thing to hold on to. He knows your next move. Okay? He had good works planned for you before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 2.10. And he will bring to completion the work he has begun in you. Okay? You are his workmanship, meaning there was a plan when it all started And he's working that plan to his completion on the day when you are resurrected from this earth and the spirit that's within you as a deposit quickens your mortal body and you meet Christ in the air, joined together with a great cloud of witnesses. Oh, somebody, come on. That's the plan of God at work within your life. He's working you into his image through the process and plan he has for you. He knows your next move. You may think you know it, And you might have a plan in your heart, but the Lord directs your steps. And many times when we are frustrated about the next thing, we're waiting on the next thing, the next child, the first child, the marriage, the house, the job, the promotion, the peace in my home, whatever the next thing. 
and we just so easily forget about the last thing, which is the, all the faith we need for the next thing. But we're complaining to him about the next thing, not even mentioning the last thing. But we're all there waiting on the next thing. But sometimes the next thing scares us. Sometimes we don't want the next thing to come because we think it's going to be something we don't want. And let me tell you something that happened last year, right about the sixth month of Seth's life. We had the same primary doctor his whole life. And as some of you have seen, he's off the charts, weight and height. I don't know where that comes from. Uh, but <laughs> there he is right there looking slick in that Henley and them acid wash jeans. But we took him in for like his six month checkup or something. And uh, there was a new doctor there, a lady we'd never met. And she starts measuring Seth and doing all this stuff. And she starts talking about his head size, right? How big his head is. And I wasn't there. Megan was there for this one. So she gets concerned, gets all, it's Megan all concerned says, we're going to send him for a, a test. We want him to... <laughs> and so the next thing I know, I'm being dragged into Savannah to go put his little head... On. I'm not telling you, don't do this, your doc. But anyway, I didn't enjoy it. But I went and... So they look at his head and the guy says, oh, he's fine, he's fine. So the next checkup we go back to, our normal doctor is there. And he says, I see that they sent you into Savannah to uh, get his head scanned. And Megan says, yeah, the last doctor we saw when we were here was concerned and was talking about his head size and that it might be, might be a problem. And Megan was like, what do you think? And he said, I'm not worried about that boy's head. I know his father. What are you worried about? Don't worry. I know your father. Don't worry. I know your father. Isn't it amazing? Thousands of years of religion and pursuit and trying to understand who God is. Read this book. Lay on this mat. Pray toward this city. Wear these clothes. Wear this hat. And Jesus comes. He stands on the side of a mountain and begins to give a sermon. And he starts talking about the everyday stuff. He starts talking about the heart and the everyday little decisions. But then he gets to the big one. And he says, why are you worried about the next thing? Why are you worried about tomorrow? It's got enough in it. There's enough in today. So let me tell you about my father. He feeds the birds. He clothes the flowers. Come on, I want you to receive that right now. Why don't you lift your hands if that's you in this room right now. Thank you, Lord. Don't worry. I know your father. You're going to eat tomorrow, and it's going to be good. You're going to have clothes. You're going to have shelter. Now, let me tell you this, and this is so important. Sometimes you don't want what you should want. And sometimes you want what you shouldn't want. He knows what you actually need, and that's what you'll eat tomorrow. He knows what you actually need, and that's what you're going to eat tomorrow. I'll tell you one more. This happened just the other night. We were coming home, and it was late. We had been in a meeting, but it was a good meeting. I was sitting at the table. This team has formed around us, people excited have caught the vision, coming, coming to the church after work, planning things with us. I mean, it was just this moment, you know, like I remember these moments that we had, and I was so happy, but it was almost 9.30, and now we're rushing to Meg's parents to pick Seth up, and it's way too late. We don't ever, you know, get him to bed this late. We try not to. Sometimes it happens, and we're on the way home, and we've got this whole nighttime routine that we do every single night, 
But on this night, I just thought to myself, Megs, let's have a snuggle party with Seth. Right? Let's snuggle party it up. Just don't even give him a bath. Put his PJs on and put him in the bed with us. Now, all you seasoned people, don't even say it. I know what you're thinking right now. But I said, let's just let him sleep with us. This has nothing to do with this story, but it was the worst decision. Neither of us slept at all, all night. May, I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and Megan was like, he's kicking me in my back. You're snoring. With right? I'm sorry. I was, come on. And we, we both got kicked out of the bed. Me and Seth was like, come on, come on, let's go. But I was all excited. Let's do a snuggle party. So in my mind, I started to imagine, let's get him in. Let's all get in there, turn on a movie he likes. I mean, he deserves it. We've been gone all day. He was at Grandma's house, although he was in heaven at Grandma's. Because there ain't no telling what that woman does when we're not looking. You know, he's just the king there. But we went and picked him up. And we get back to the house. And as I walk in, Meg goes, oh, I washed the sheets today. I was like, that is not a bad thing. Come on, fresh wash sheets. This, this snuggle party just got better. So she says, all right, let me get him ready, and you get the bed ready. So I get the sheets out, put him on the bed, doing it like Megan likes me to do it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, here comes Seth in his birthday suit, just waddling into the room and he sees what's going on here he has put it all together and he sees me making the bed and he starts whining I mean like I'm gonna go put you in your crib whine right and he gets underneath me and I'm trying to make the bed He's steady whining, so I say, okay, son, all right, Megs, what are you doing? She's back there getting something, and he's in there with me naked. And then, and then Meg says, hold on one second, got to use the bathroom. And she runs through, and she goes into our bathroom right there by our, our bedroom. And, and I'm sitting there walking around to the other side now, and I'm moving the sheet. And he's still whining. He's coming to the other side now. And now he's pulling on the sheets. And all of a sudden, something hit my heart, and I said, Seth, why are you whining? I'm working. Why are you whining? I'm working. In fact, I'm working on something for you. And before you even saw this bed, I pictured in my mind a snuggle party. But when we came home, in your limited perspective, all you could see was a bed about to be made. But I've got so much more than you could even imagine in my mind for you. And my little son's like. <laughs> and Megan said, "Woo, that'll preach. I said, I'm going to preach it Saturday night. Why are you whining? He's working. I looked down at him. I said, it is of no advantage to you. In fact, you're slowing me down when you start pulling on those sheets. But if you would just step back and celebrate for what's about to happen in this room. But your perspective is limited by what you can see. His ways are higher than your ways. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And what has never come anywhere near your imagination has been his plan all along. He knows you when you're 70. There is no past, present, or future for him. It is just now. And he's saying no to a prayer you're praying today because he's saying yes to a prayer you're going to pray then. I don't even know if that makes sense, but it's somewhere close to the truth. Why are you whining? 
Isn't it amazing? Over and over and over and over, he says, guard your lips. Bridle your tongue. And let me show you what good leadership looks like in every situation of our life. While I have lived under this man's leadership, you know the three things he's told me when things start going wrong or things aren't happening as fast as I want them to? Guard your mouth. Guard your heart. Guard your life. Guard your mouth. Guard your life. Guard your heart. Why are you whining? Even the worst stuff. I mean the worst. He will maximize for his glory and your good. And it is the craziest thing in Christ that we go through some of the worst hell and rain, wind, and flood that this life can throw at us. But years removed from it, most of us who invited Christ into those situations, who daily leaned into him and asked him for strength, who leaned into him and leaned into friends and leaned into leaders and leaned into community and said, help me, help me, help me, now in our present would not go back and change the pain of that scenario. Why are you whining? He's working. He's making the bed. That's your word tonight. He's making the bed. You're whining. He's making the bed. Guard your lips. Guard your heart. Guard your life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I am crushed in my spirit, but I am not driven to despair. Morning will last through the night. But joy burst into my day like the sun coming over the horizon. Why are you whining? He's working. In my weakness, he is strong. He is made to be strong. He is glorified in my failures and my successes. Why are you whining? Step back and celebrate that he is your father. And although you don't know what's going on between his ears, you don't know what's in the mind of God except by the spirit of God to guide your daily decisions. And you don't even know what you should pray. But what a good thing it is that Romans 8 says to you and I, that inside of us lives the Holy Spirit, which interprets my weak prayers according to the will of God. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he glorified. Those who are called according to his purposes, he is working all things together for their good. He's making the bed. He's making the bed. I want you to lift your hands in this moment tonight. Come on. Father, refresh our hearts. Guard our lips. Guard our life. Let praise and thanksgiving, peace and unity, the bond of Christ be on our lips. Help us to mend the fences with those we have offense. Help us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Help us not to grow bitter in the replay of the pain someone else caused. Help us to lay it at the cross, the offenses against us and the things we don't want to forgive. Help us in this day to have faith that what's next is in your heart and in your mind and what we've not even imagined you've planned ahead of us. Help us, Lord. Receive your peace tonight. Help us, Lord, to have faith, to walk by faith, to love you, to trust you, that you know best. And let praise be on our lips, thanksgiving be on our lips, 
Help us bridle our tongues that we would see your work more clearly. We would see your hand at work in our life more clearly. Isn't it amazing? You can put your hands down. Isn't it amazing that Paul prays, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. And then he says that he has seated us in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. What's he doing? He's just trying to change your perspective. He's trying to help you see it the way he sees it. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Father, we love you tonight. Help us to know your ways. Help us to know your truth. To know you as the God of our salvation and to wait and renew our strength in every situation of our life. Help us, Father, not to whine, but for praise to be on our lips. Guard our hearts, Lord, that we would not fear what's next. Whatever evidences have been presented to us in life at this moment that cause us to fear our future, help us not to worry because we know our Father. We lean into you for your wisdom, your guidance, your understanding in our daily decisions that we would know the will of God for our life because we apply your word to the daily decisions of our life. And we follow your ways, your path as your children. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement just gave a big shout, amen.